before we get into our dispatch, let me give you a little breakdown of how Taboo Table Talk is going to be released going forward. Uh, on Thursdays in the evening, probably around 5 p.m. Eastern or 6 p.m. Eastern, um, I will be releasing the interview episode of Taboo Table Talk. This will be primarily focused on the guests, what they're talking about, the issues that they are most passionate about, and less uh, rambly shit from me in the beginning of the episodes. I know I tend to ramble sometimes in the beginning of the episodes, so uh, there'll be less of that. Uh, the the pre-show, post-show uh, monologues, I suppose you could call them, will be more focused on announcements, updates, uh, promotions, things of that sort. Um, they will also no longer include the dispatch, which is which is what you're listening to now. And if you are unfamiliar with what these dispatches are or were, they were uh, they're primarily uh, you know uh, current events and news oriented commentary pieces, uh, similar to a segment you might see on a, a program like Redacted Tonight with Lee Camp. Right? They're 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 more written and uh, less uh, ranty and f- and 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 freeform um, as my live streams are. My live streams are more ranty and freeform. So. These are more written um, and uh, and a little bit more focused on one particular story. Why am I doing this? Uh, one, because my schedule is changing. Um, I'm getting a new part-time job, so that means that uh, things are kind of shifting around for me, a little, little transition for me. Um, so in order to make sure that I can give you guys the content that I normally give you guys, I want to make sure I have the time to do it. Uh, so, so that's one reason. The other reason is I do want the, the interviews to be more focused on the, on, on the guest itself. Um, and I think, uh, what eventually started happening is that the dispatches started taking over a little bit more of the podcast, uh, and they started becoming longer and, you know, it was getting like the guest wasn't the interview for the guest wasn't really coming in until like 30, 35 minutes into the, into the podcast. So I I wanted it to be more focused on the guest so that we get to the interview in five to 10 minutes. Um, and then this allows me to cover more stories, right? I can do two current event stories in one. I can do a longer deep dive, uh, into, into certain stories, um, you know, I can I can do more kitschy, weird news pieces as well. So this allows me to cover a little bit more, write a little bit more, which is what I like doing a whole lot more. Is as I do have a writer brain, so uh, you know sometimes the rants that you hear on the live streams wind up being uh, you know more constructed, thought out pieces uh, that uh, you know you hear on a dispatch or on Forkful of Noodles. So. Uh, I like writing. It's 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 where my passion is. So I want to try to write a little bit more. So it gives me the opportunity to do that. Um, so those are kind of the reasons why I decided to separate the two podcasts and release them. You know, back to back essentially throughout the week. As, as the interviews go out on Thursdays, the dispatches will be coming out on Fridays. Uh, as you are listening to now. So so going forward, that's kind of what's going to happen, and that's going to be the format of the show. Uh, so without any further ado, I think it's time that we got into our dispatch for this week. Joe Biden takes a cue from his predecessors, a wannabe fascist, Donald Trump, and a sweet talking young black neoliberal Barack Obama, who I'm pretty sure he's called boy more than a few times. Oh, which cue you might be asking well it's the cue to say that we're getting the troops out of afghanistan that's right strike up the mission accomplished banner and get biden and bush on ellen together because we're wiping the blood off of their stained hands on national television with some awkward dancing and uncoordinated moves we're did we did it we did it okay all right before people start actually celebrating and replacing their photos of Jesus and Buddha and Vishnu and Oprah with one of Joe Biden smelling a child's hair as if to steal their essence. The withdrawal of troops in Afghanistan is actually being pushed back by a few months. Originally, it was supposed to happen on May 1st, 2021, after Trump had struck a deal with the Taliban. But Joe Biden didn't see that happening. He just... It's too soon, you guys. It's just too soon. Look, Joey B's got wars to start, not end them. 
Okay, hell, we've re-engaged in Syria, and if things go according to plan, we'll attack Iran soon enough. And when that happens, the day that it happens, the moment that that happens, 30 years worth of jism will erupt out of Mike Pompeo. And I, and I am sorry. I am very sorry to put that image into your brains, but I feel far worse for Pompeo's housekeeper. Look, Biden wants to pull out troops by September 11th, 2021, just about 20 years since the invasion and occupation of Afghanistan. Obviously, this is to mark the special date on the calendar and turn September 11th into another holiday where we spend money on hokey merchandise and possibly a barbecue. It'll be the day that we triumphed over terror and found freedom while making eye contact with a Biden-esque eagle. But, much like an infomercial, conditions do apply. Senior Biden officials are claiming that the pullout will be, quote, condition-based. This is the same rationale horny teenagers and adults use for not wearing a condom. It's condition-based. Look, you should wrap it before you tap it, and always, always reject American imperialism. And yes, I am saying that U.S. imperialism is the equivalent of raw docking a stranger in a nightclub b a bathroom because the opportunity presented itself and you manufactured consent to do so. Now, Biden also claimed that this was a recipe to stay in Afghanistan forever. And that's always been the plan. There has never been an exit strategy to get out of Afghanistan. America wants to be the lingering figure in the background of Afghanis' lives till time stops. It's like when the principal would come into your class to evaluate the teacher, right? You just try and pretend they're not there, but you know they're there. And for some reason, the principal is pointing a bazooka at all the kids. That's literally the plan that America had for Afghanistan. They And they're manufacturing consent to stay well past their third deadline for withdrawing troops from Afghanistan. Republican Representative Adam Kinzer says that the U.S. should stay in Afghanistan to keep China from accessing the country's mineral wealth. And, and we can't forget to mention the billions of dollars worth of de Department of Defense contracts to over 17 war profiteers. So it's capitalism's two favorite excuses to continue violating human rights and being a force of death and destruction the Red Scare, and the economy. But that's not the story corporate media, a.k.a. the propaganda wing of America's war economy, wants us to focus on. The reason they claim America needs to extend its stay in Afghanistan is to, quote, protect women's rights. That's what it's all been for, guys. It's been for the ladies. The Center for Strategic and International Studies, or CSIS, says that the condition-based withdrawal needs to be focused on ensuring the advancement of women's rights in Afghanistan. CSIS is funded by Northrop Grumman, Boeing, ExxonMobil, Chevron, and Saudi Amarco. Yeah, I'm pretty sure we should be taking anything CSIS says on a conditional basis especially since they're funded by organizations that could care less about women's rights. They're more for profiteering off of, you know, destruction. Yeah, the destruction of human life and the planet. The rhetoric and spin is all about protecting women's rights from the big, bad, oppressive governments in the Middle East. But in reality, America is the one responsible for putting women's rights in jeopardy in Afghanistan. Back in the 70s, Afghanistan was a socialist nation. They upheld women's rights. Their education system was thriving and didn't discriminate. And their minimum wage was higher than America's. Not just that, but peasants were landowners and they had a stronger, more legitimate unions than America. Now, this was the exact opposite of what America believed in, right? In the 70s, women folks weren't meant to be in school or working. Okay, they were meant to be in the kitchen or at the disco. And when they were at the disco longer than deemed appropriate, American imperialism killed disco. 
Yeah, that's right. Not not a lot of people know this, but that was the uh, first drone bombing was to destroy all of uh, Disco. It was a coordinated attack. Not a lot of people. This is breaking news right here. But look, in the 70s, unions were also demonized much like they are today. Right? Companies like Amazon used Cold War rhetoric like saying workers would lose their jobs and livelihoods for even thinking of unions. They would remind workers that in communist countries, the unions organize you. Damn it, that's exactly what they do. Ah, shit. And, and look, really, when you say it out loud, it doesn't sound so bad, does it? Let's all do it together. Let's all do it together. Let's all say it. The unions organize you. It just That just sounds fun, delightful, you know? It just sounds fun being organized. Ah, what a nice time that would be. Oh, but the government of Afghanistan was working with Russia at that time, which would mean that America's Red Scare was going to take these fools down, just like Rocky took down that Russian, probably. I don't remember. I didn't watch that movie too closely. So America sold weapons and trained the Mujahideen, the organization that would become the Taliban. That's right. America supported the anti-woman, anti-worker, dictatorial gang in order to throw a functioning country that took care of its people. But when Russia decided to take a step back from Afghanistan, the hope was that the U.S. would too. And eventually, they would. But not before the CIA armed these guys to the teeth to make, the Afga make Afghanistan a failed state run by warlords and the Taliban. Remember, the goal is to control the oil, minerals, and natural resources of the country before the commie boogeyman does. Hey, Americans sold out a functioning socialist democracy for a pipeline and control of opium farms. So, in reality, none of this is really about women's rights. I mean... If it was about women's rights, they wouldn't have wrecked a nation and allowed warlords to take over, and they'd also disavow Saudi Arabia, whose monarchy has been abhorrent when it comes to women or any human's rights. Or they'd also push back when Republicans in America take away necessary services for low-income women with lies, propaganda, and withholding of information. And... As Representative Kinzer mentioned, it's all about getting those minerals and natural get resources. It's all about making sure the women's contract, the, the weapons contractors, not the women's contract. That would be weird if we contracted. Never mind. That's a we're not going to go down that rabbit hole. But it's, it's about making sure that the weapon contractors don't get mad about losing billions of dollars and losing the one thing that gets them aroused. Death and destruction. No wonder America has such an unhealthy obsession with serial killers. We prop them up as titans of industry and role models. CEOs of companies like Lockheed Martin, Raytheon, and General Dynamic are just as sadistic as Ted Bundy, John, Gate, well, John Wayne Gacy, and of the like. But after saying all of this, let's give Biden the benefit of the doubt. Right? And let's say that he does withdraw the 2,500 troops in Afghanistan by September 11th of this year. He probably won't be moving the additional CIA, special forces, and mercenary personnel out of the country, and neither will it lose the additional 6,500 uh, NATO forces that will be staying put in the country as well. Not only that, but there's nothing saying that they won't drone bomb the country either. And look, with America's records on drone bombing, it looks like Afghanistan shouldn't have public weddings for a while. Regardless of anything about this plan, the people that have been victimized by U.S. imperialism the most in Afghanistan are the Afghani people. They're the ones who had their democracy stolen from them through American fear-mongering and the need to sell weapons to the enemy. And most of Congress would say, well, won't somebody just think about the economy right okay they're the ones being demonized for an act of terror they didn't commit i mean most afghanis didn't even know what the world trade center was and there were no afghanis on the plane either and the afghani people are the ones that are suffering the consequences of war they have no health care lack of clean water and food Meanwhile, Dick Cheney has six hearts, all the Dasanis he wants, and steak fed to him by a Malaysian prostitute the Bush family gifted to him. 
Look, there shouldn't be any applauses or dance breaks for this news. There should be solidarity from the working class in America with the working class in Afghanistan. The working class are the ones who go fight the rich man's war. So now is the time that we stop. If the rich want to plunder a country for their resources to create failed state, then they should go and do it on their own, not off of the backs of the global working class. And that has been your dispatch for this week. If you enjoyed this, please make sure you hit the like button. Please make sure you hit the share button. Leave a comment. Leave a review. Let people know that you enjoyed this uh, and, uh, and, and tell some other folks about it. Content like this is, is often suppressed on some of the larger corporate uh, media outlets such as YouTube and Facebook. So uh, it, it, sharing is really the way that, that uh, we can get the word out. Um, and uh, the, uh, the other way is to go and uh, subscribe to alternative media platforms such as Rockfin and Odyssey. I post my content on there as well. But it is up to you to help spread the word uh, 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 about stories like this. I'm very excited to announce that I'm bringing back the live virtual stand-up comedy shows once a month, last Friday of every month. Tickets for those shows are available on my website at krishmohanhaha.com. It's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A.com. Uh, while you're on my website, you can do a plethora of different things. You can catch up on episodes of this very podcast, uh, of my live stream show, Road Reflections, and past episodes of Fork Full of Noodles, uh, which are related to the live virtual comedy shows that I'm doing. That's that's how they're recorded. They're recorded in front of a live virtual audience. So uh, you can catch up on those. Uh, if you want to, you can also make a one-time donation or become a sustaining member. Sustaining members get free tickets to those live virtual comedy shows I just talked about. Uh, they also get additional bonus stand-up comedy content that nobody else gets, as well as some free additional fun gifts that I am planning to, uh, to send to uh, the sustaining members. You can also check out my stand-up comedy albums uh, that are available on my website. And if you go to my Bandcamp, which is krishmohanhaha.bandcamp.com, you can get pretty much my entire stand-up comedy collection for free. Uh, uh, there's, I think, one comedy album that you might have to pay for right now, uh, but everything's on a pay-what-you-can uh, price level. So if you would like to get most of that stuff for free, you can do so over on my Bandcamp page, which, again, is krishmohanhaha.bandcamp.com. And lastly, I also want to let you guys know that uh, if, uh, if you're not a fan of the YouTubes, uh, or the Facebooks and their censorship of, uh, of content creators uh, that uh, talk about anti-establishment topics, uh, a good place to go right now would be to Rockfin. You can find my channel over on rockfin.com slash krishmohanhaha. Uh, they're a blockchain crypto site that primarily focuses on ensuring that content creators can earn a living by creating content and they're uncensored so you can basically talk about what you feel like you need to talk about without the censorship of any sort of algorithm uh, and uh, and all the content will be curated based on what you subscribe to so once again go to rockfin.com slash krishmohanhaha uh, the subscriptions are about ten dollars a month but when you become a subscriber over at rockfin you not only get my premium content but you get the premium content of basically every single content creator that's on Rockfin. That's Graham Elwood, that's Ron Pacone, Lee Camp, Kim Iverson, Nico House, Jimmy Dore, The Convo Couch, Action for Assange, and plenty more. Uh, so be sure uh, to to check out Rockfin, and if you're ready to leave YouTube, that is the place to go to, to become a subscriber. Leave tips for channels that you like, and there's plenty of free content on there as well. Thank you so much for tuning in.